Welcome everyone. We have a beautiful, beautiful day here for our press conference in front of the State House Annex. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you advocates for the sites for bringing signs. Please feel free to share them. We have uh, Kenny from the Lot Trenton Journal here sharing this on a live stream. So people uh, in their homes and in the workplaces can also see this important event today. So thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you for joining on the live stream. Without further ado, I'll tell you a little bit about how today is going to go. My name is Emily Manns. I'm the executive director here at Preservation New Jersey. Um, we are going to have a welcome from our uh, board president, Paul Muir. We'll then have, whoops, <laughs> it's very windy, the formal reading of the 10 most endangered historic places of New Jersey by members of the PNJ board and the PNJ 10 most subcommittee. We will then be joined by uh, advocates for the specific sites if they wish to come up and share a few remarks. After we've completed this portion of the event today, you are all welcome to join us at the William Trent House uh, for a small, light lunch and refreshment and for ne more networking. Um, so I hope that you do join us there. We were there this morning getting that set up and it looks beautiful. Um, it'll be really nice to get to meet everyone in person after a couple years of just kind of emails and phone calls, right? So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce Paul Muir, our board president, uh, to welcome you to the event. Welcome, welcome everyone. You can hear me clearly enough through the, the noise. So welcome, it's wonderful to see you all in person back here again. I was just sharing last time I was here, it's 2019, battling the wind as we are today. But uh, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Paul Muir, your uh, new Preservation New Jersey president. I'm also the director of the Red Mill Museum Village in Clinton, New Jersey. So uh, I say we are a recipient and a practitioner of historic preservation as we get to use our site to, to share our history. So when we talk about the pres historic preservation, especially our 10 most, these structures go beyond the, the aesthetic beauty that we want to restore. They carry the stories. They share the culture of the communities where they, re where they reside. And they also help promote economic viability and redevelopment opportunities in those areas. So these are very important to the communities that they're in, and we're very proud to present the 10 most to you today. So with that, I'll turn it back to Emily to talk about the 10 most, and we'll get our presenters starting to come up after that. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Paul is our new board president. We're so excited for the energy and experience he brings at the Red Mill to Preservation New Jersey. So I wanted to, um, first of all, just introduce what the 10 Most Endangered Historic Places program is. So it has been 27 years that we have been running this program at Preservation New Jersey. And I'm excited to announce that right now we're in the midst of a first of its kind ever update of all the 200 plus sites and themes um, of the 10 Most Endangered Historic Places. New contact information, new information about the sites, whether they've been saved, lost forever, or somewhere in between. So we're very excited that we're working on that. The list is important because it brings awareness to these sites that are in critical need across the state. They represent sites in different counties, different kinds of sites we have today, from a boat to cemeteries to what we think of maybe a more historic house. So the sites range. There also are in various threats against them. Sometimes the threat is demolition by neglect. Sometimes it's a threat of redevelopment and development. Sometimes it's something else entirely. We're going to learn about all the 10 most endangered historic places today at this event. Uh, and then again, you will hear directly from some of the site advocates that have nominated these sites. How does the 10 most endangered historic places process work? Uh, nominations are taken from the public um, and we receive those nominations and we go through them very closely with a 10 most committee. You're going to meet members of that 10 most committee today. And then uh, those sites are selected, we research more about them, and we bring them to you today at the 10 most announcement. So thank you again, all of you, for being here. I want to thank our 10 most committee members who are going to read to you in a moment. I want to thank our board members who are being here. And I want to thank our sponsors for today's event. You can see our sponsors here, HOR Architects, Cryland Conservation, Jablonski Building Associates, Architectural Window Corporation, and Mills and Shoring Architects. Thank you, all of you, for sponsoring this event and making it happen. I also want to thank New Jersey Historic Commission, uh, from which we have an operating grant at Preservation New Jersey, and a COVID-19 grant that allows us to both have this event in person and make sure people back at home can see it as well. And we have a live stream, thanks to that grant, from the Trenton Journal. So thank you, everyone. I'm now going to turn it over to our Preservation New Jersey board member, Ruby Simmons, 
to begin the reading of the 10 most endangered historic places in New Jersey. Thank you. Good morning. The first that I'm going to read about is the Anchor Cafe, Perth Amboy, Middlesex County. The Anchor Cafe is a three-story brick and terracotta structure with a steep slate roof and dormers built in 1905. A round tower with a conical roof gives it a commanding presence in the streetscape. The building is dripping with architectural terracotta in the form of keystones, brackets, window molding, roof pressing, and a large terracotta plaque depicting an anchor. Perth Amboy was the center of a thriving terracotta industry, and the city has an unusual dense concentration of buildings designed with architectural terracotta. Storefronts, schools, municipal buildings, and private homes sport decorations made from carved and molded terracotta. Perth Amboy's immigrant population worked in the terracotta factories and produce the very products that adorn their community. The Anchor Cafe embodies the unique terracotta architecture of Perth Amboy. These architectural details survive on the goodwill of their owners and with little oversight. Their preservation is threatened. Preservation New Jersey strongly encourages special municipal recognition of the terracotta buildings and the special story that they tell about Perth Amboy. Next is the Caldwell Public Library, Borough of Caldwell, Essex County. The Caldwell Public Library is a 1917 classical revival Carnegie Library designed by architect and Caldwell resident Lynn Grover Lockwood. It is one of the four Carnegie libraries in Essex County, still in its original building. The library is a one-story, three-bay brick building and is distinguished by its temple-like austerity and diminutive size. The civic and formal appearance is reinforced by decoration derived from classical elements, including tripartite vertical division with a projecting central bay, round arc multi-paned windows, and a freeze parapet. The borough is planning to demolish the Caldwell Public Library and redevelop the area as part of a municipal complex to include Borough Hall, the police department, a community center, and a health and human service facility. It is a special for a town to have a Carnegie Library. The library and its ability to tell the story of Cardwell and the legacy of Andrew Carnegie to future generations is irreplaceable. The building can be adaptively reused or at a minimum the facade can be preserved and incorporated into the plans for the new building. Preservation New Jersey urges the borough of Caldwell to consider their plans for, de de for demolition and adopt a policy of adaptive reuse for this landmark building. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby, for reading the first two 10 most endangered historic places in New Jersey. Next will be our committee member, Deborah Kelly. Deborah has served on the 10 most committee for the entire length of our of our 10 most. It's just such an accomplishment and such a wonderful volunteer. So thank you. Come on up, Deborah. Well, she makes me feel old to say I've served on it the entire length for 27 years. So I'm very happy to read to you about the Roebling Free Stretcher Equipment and Buildings. Very, very cool resources. They're located in Florence Township in Burlington County. The Roebling Wire Road Pre Stretcher and its buildings, which are officially called Buildings 92 and 93, are the last remaining industrial structures from the John A. Roebling Sons Steel and Wire Mill, 
which operated in Roebling, New Jersey from 1905 to 1974. The company pioneered suspension bridge construction. The pre-stretcher is significant as an artifact of Roebling engineering, engineering New Jersey industrial history and the history of bridge building and civil engineering. The Roebling Museum interprets this history. And if you haven't been to the Roebling Museum, you have to visit. It's, it's a wonderful museum. The mill property was named a Superfund site in 1983. The EPA has demolished nearly every building on the property and now seeks to demolish buildings 92 and 93 that currently house and provide the original context for the pre-structure. Under Section 106, the EPA is required to consider the effect of its actions on historic properties. In 2004, EPA designated the pre-stretcher in buildings 92 and 93 as historic and emphasized the significance of the pre-stretcher's location and the spatial relation of the two 90-year-old buildings. The EPA now argues that demolishing the two buildings and moving the equipment to a new building on the property will be the most cost-effective. The New Jersey State Historic Preservation Office has suggested alternative preservation approaches to the EPA, but the agency so far remains unmoved. Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act requires consultation with the New Jersey Historic Preservation Office and other interested parties before it makes its final decision on the property. Preservation New Jersey urges the EPA to allow for the pre-stretcher in buildings 92 and 93 to remain on site so that future generations can view this industrial feature in its original context. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks for all your great service to this committee. Next, we have Janice Armstrong, who is another longtime volunteer on the Tedros Committee, continuing to read our list. Come on up, Janice. St. Peter's Grammar School, Jersey City, Hudson County. St. Peter's Parish School was built in 1861 as Jersey City's first parochial school. In 1898, St. Peter's Hall was constructed abutting the building. The buildings, together known as the school, function as one building. Construction with Romanesque revival and Italianate elements, the school boasts terracotta ornamentation, corbelled brick arches, brownstone trim, and a cupola. The school operates, ha, operated for over 150 years, serving generations of immigrants. Latino and Filipino immigrants became a large portion of the school's students. Starting in the mid 20th century, and St. Peter's Church was the first Catholic church in Hudson County to offer services in Spanish. The school was also used for community and political events. Woodrow Wilson launched his gubernatorial campaign in St. Peter's Hall. The school was purchased by St. Peter's Preparatory School Prep in 2002. Since then, the school has been mostly vacant and falling into a state of repair. In 2019, the prep applied to Jersey City Historic Preservation Commission to demolish the school and replace it with a parking lot. The application was unanimously denied, but prep is currently appealing the denial. The school is located in downtown Jersey City's historic Wallace Hook neighborhood, which has experienced significant development of high-rise buildings. The school is one of the few non-residential Civil War era buildings still surviving downtown. Given its architectural and historical significance and location in a historically significant neighborhood, Preservation New Jersey opposes the demolition of the school and supports its adaptive reuse. A totally different part of the state the Stockton Inn, the borough of Stockton, Hunterdon County. The Stockton Inn sits near the site of taverns dating to the 18th century. The Colligan family operated the inn for several decades, beginning in 1915, 
and became a well-known establishment popular with creative locals and visitors for the next 80 years. A patio with a waterfall and a wishing well was added in the 1930s, which inspired the lyrics for There's a Small Hotel, a great American songbook hit. In 2015, it was acquired by an investor who tried to reinvent the inn as a high-end restaurant, but it closed in 2017 and has since been vacant. In 2020, a developer made plans to redevelop the property with, an eight, with a 780 seat outdoor concert venue, additional hotel rooms, and a health spa. The project met local opposition due to the scale, traffic, parking, and noise concerns. The developer asked the borough to designate the property as an area in need of redevelopment. However, the project was withdrawn in 2021 and the designation was not enacted. Today, the inn sits vacant and deteriorating with weather-related roof damage. The extended closure of the landmark has created a dead zone in the center of the active downtown. Preservation New Jersey supports adaptive reuse or, if needed, sensitive redevelopment of the site that allows for the preservation of this much-loved inn and respects the character of the downtown. Thank you so much, Janice. Next up is our office manager, Dale Perry, to continue the, re the reading of the 10 most endangered historic places in New Jersey. The next site is the Sandless House, Sandy Hook, Monmouth County. Sandless House, located at the entrance to the Sandy Hook unit of the Gateway National Recreation Area, is the only surviving building of a once extensive resort complex built as part of Sandy Hook's Golden Age. Built in 1893, the house was part of the Highland Beach Excursion Resort, which served as a community hub from 1888 until 1961. It opened its doors during the emergence of increased leisure time for the middle class and served over 125,000 visitors a season at the turn of the century. The state of New Jersey owns the house with an agreement that allows the National Park Service to manage the property. The house is now under imminent threat of roof collapse due to lack of repairs and maintenance. In 2021, a petition was delivered to the National Park Service with 1,800 signatures that requested the historical significance of the house to New Jersey transportation history be recognized and the Sandless House be put into the new Sandy Hook NPS leasing program as an Airbnb. Preservation New Jersey supports these actions, which would allow an interested entrepreneur to evaluate the house, make a roof repair, and renovate the building. The next site is the First United Methodist Church of Bradley Beach, Monmouth County. The First United Methodist Church is a Queen Anne-style masterpiece in the heart of Bradley Beach. The interior boasts magnificent woodwork, stained glass windows, and the original Jardine-type organ. The building is also significant to the town's history. According to a 1900 article in the Asbury Park Press, its construction was made possible by a donation from the town's namesake, James A. Bradley, to the Bradley Beach Methodist. After sitting unoccupied for six years, the Friends of Bradley Beach Community Center organized a petition with over 500 residents and successfully urged the borough to purchase and save the vacant church. The hope was to use the church as the borough's new community center. Now, years later, the borough is deciding on whether to convert it into a community center or sell it to a private developer, which could spell demolition for new construction. On March 1, 2022, at a town hall meeting, architects retained the borough, retained by the borough of Bradley Beach, presented residents with three proposals for turning the church into a community center and were met with objections from some residents and elected officials concerned with cost. It is likely to be 
decided by referendum later this year. Preservation New Jersey supports the view of the Friends of the Bradley Beach Community Center who continue to advocate for its repurposing as a community center. Next, Barton Rass, co-chair of the Tedbo Selections Committee, will present. All right, thank you. I'll try to speak loudly. Uh, this is the USS Ling, Hackensack, Bergen County. The USS Ling is a U.S. Navy Malau class submarine and won a five year later World War II Coast Guard. It came into service in 1945. With the end of World War II, it was decommissioned a few months later and became part of the Atlantic Reserve Fleet until 1960. It was then used as a training submarine at the Brooklyn Naval Yard until 1971. In 1972, the USS Ling was transferred to the Submarine Memorial Association, a nonprofit established to save it from being sold as scrap and to interpret its historic significance. The submarine was operated as a museum and it's listed on the state and national registers of historic places. In 2012, Hurricane Sandy caused severe flooding along the banks of the Hackensack River, severely damaging the museum. This combined with silt buildup on the river resulted in full closure of the museum and the submarine by 2016, and deferred maintenance ensued. In 2018, an inspection found that the USS Ling had sprung a leak, which caused significant water damage. The submarine requires a full overhaul with significant costs, as one of only five remaining submarines of its class, and the only one in New Jersey. Preservation New Jersey calls attention to the need for the stabilization and restoration of the submarine for its ability to connect future generations to military history of the 20th century. Thank you. So uh, we're literally fighting with construction noise today. <laughs> so um, our next and last speaker, Ricky Massan, uh, is going to close us out strong uh, with the last two uh, thematic categories for New Jersey's 10 most engaging historic places. Come on up. Good morning, everyone. How are we today? Yeah. Good. I would like to thank Emily, our board members, Paul and Billy taking the photographs, and all of you for being here. All right, now let's get this list done. <laughs> Underrepresented histories in New Jersey. Where are we? The Great Garden State. The garden grows all flowers. Though New Jersey is one of the most diverse states in the nation, we have a long way to go in identifying and preserving historic sites that reflect that diversity. When historic sites associated with underrepresented communities are not identified, they face erasure. When sites are identified, we can fight for the stories and ideally the physical structures to be preserved. Just this year, Rutgers Newark announced the addition of the former Plain Street Colored Church to the National Park Service's National Underground Railroad Freedom Network with extensive research done by historian Noel Lorraine Williams in the Black Abolitionist Movement. Down in Cape May, a state grant will help the Historic Preservation Commission there conduct more targeted research into African American history after the opening of the Harriet Tubman Museum. New Jersey needs to fund more research, including county, local, and statewide context studies that match themes with specific sites. At the same time, begin to break down the barriers that prevent sites from being listed on the local, state, and national registers of historic places. Preservation New Jersey urges municipalities, there's a lot in this state, municipal madness, <laughs> We urge municipalities, counties, and statewide bodies to apply for and develop resources to identify sites that tell underrepresented histories and push forward the national conversation around retooling the criteria and process for historic designation. The next category and last is cemeteries. God rest the dead. Cemetery, cemeteries are important repositories of history and culture. In addition to memorializing the debts of individual people, 
Cemeteries associated with historic events, such as the Civil War, can be pathways into historic records. Sometimes cemeteries contain geological re records, otherwise not available prior to the routinization of vital records reporting in the early 20th century. The lack of maintenance, care, and abandonment of cemeteries in New Jersey threaten these important historic resources. In our state, major causes of cemetery decline include ethnic population movement, dissolution of congregations associated with religious cemeteries, government policies that explicitly promote cemetery desecration and prioritization of development. The impact of decline and abandonment on New Jersey cemeteries can be significantly reduced by changes in the New Jersey cemetery laws as follows. The New Jersey Cemetery Act currently focuses only on privately owned cemetery companies and exempts religious cemeteries from its provisions. Religious cemeteries are not required to have trust funds to ensure maintenance and upkeep to register with the cemetery board or to comply with other provisions that facilitate their preservation. The New Jersey Abandoned Cemetery Maintenance and Preservation Act's definition of abandoned cemeteries excludes religious and publicly owned cemeteries and it requires no more than 10% of burials to have occurred or after 1880 and it's limited to cemeteries that are less than 10 acres in coverage. It has been 25 years, quarter century, since Preservation New Jersey first declared cemeteries that were one of the most 10 endangered historic places in the state of New Jersey. Now, with this year's 10 most nomination, cemeteries including Johnson Cemetery in Camden, the Dutch Reformed Church Graveyard in Belleville, Renton Cemetery in Fort Lee, Doramus Cedar Grove Farm but Burial Ground, Canfield Cemetery in Cedar Grove. Preservation New Jersey reiterates the urgency with which New Jersey state law must be changed to save these, key, these keys to our individual and statewide collective histories. I thank you all for coming out. Let's get to work. Bravo. Thank you so much, Ricky. And Ricky is a member of PNJ's marketing committee and writes many of the incredible articles in our PNJ newsletter. So thank you, Ricky. So thank you all for listening to the reading of the 10 most endangered historic places in New Jersey. We're now going to ask advocates for the sites to come up and speak for one to two minutes about their site. I have several people I'll call up, and then we'll open it to others as well. Um, first, John Carey Dyke, who is the city historian for the city of Perth Amboy, who will speak for the Anchor Cafe. Thank you, Emily. First and foremost, let's have a round of applause for Preservation New Jersey for putting this list together. Yeah. Now, Emily said before there's a lot of construction noise, and she's right. I hope, and I know all the historians here hope, that that construction work is preservation, repairs, and restoration work, and not demolition. <laughs> yes, my name is John Dyke. I'm the Perth Amboy City Historian. On behalf of our mayor, Helmut Kaba, our Historic Preservation Commission, and myself, thank you to Preservation New Jersey for recognizing our terracotta embellished Anchor Cafe building. This structure is a prime example of many other endangered historic Perth Amboy buildings, especially those exhibiting architectural terracotta works. One of New Jersey's terracotta founders was Alfred Hall, also 19th century Perth Amboy mayor. Hall ran a brickworks factory on the Arthur Kill near his Perth Amboy home and began the production of terracotta. As historians know, Hall's venture greatly expanded in the 1870s when the Lehigh Valley Railroad made Perth Amboy its tidewater terminus for the export of Pennsylvania coal to eastern and foreign ports. That coal being used to fire the kilns. Over the ensuing decades, other terracotta companies were formed in Perth Amboy. Due to the close proximity, functional and decorative, 
architectural terracotta adorns numerous Earth Amboy buildings, such as the Anchor Cafe. Unfortunately, my hometown has already lost many of these due to unwise alterations and demolition. I and other historians are not only worried about demolition. In many cases, terracotta has been blatantly stripped off, directly off privately owned historic structures and then sold. These buildings are left devoid of their architectural beauty. Believe it or not, our historic town of Perth Amboy has no city ordinance that prevents this. However, we are working to introduce laws to stop this practice. Preservation New Jersey's inclusion of the Anchor Cafe on its endangered list will not only help us in our efforts, but also aid us in preserving a whole category of historic buildings in Perth Amboy, including those terracotta structures that are vacant and underutilized. So again, thank you, Preservation New Jersey. Paul Neshampkin from the Friends of the Bradley Beach Community Center. Thank you, Emily. I want to thank Preservation New Jersey for adding our nomination to the 10 most endangered list. Uh, the first Methodist Church at Bradley Beach was built in 1900 on a plot of land donated by the Ocean Grove Camp Meeting Association at what is now the corner of Lorraine and Madison Avenue, practically in the middle of our town. Uh, the, uh, the local parish originally was a small wooden church moved from Asbury Park as a temporary building. The parish quickly outgrew it, and uh, the parish raised money on their own to build this fine church. They hired William C. Cottrell, a local Asbury Park architect, who designed the church and went on to design uh, the casino in Asbury Park and the at the Methodist Church there, unfortunately, in both lost now. It is a remarkably preserved example of the period, and 122 years later, it is still a solid building and has its beautiful interiors intact. The church was the center of this new community then. The town was organized in 1893, and we hope that it will remain open to all Bradley Beach residents and visitors for many years to come. It was destined to be torn down and its plot subdivided for development, but we were able to get the borough of Bradley Beach to intercede, and in early 2019, they purchased the church to save it with the hope of converting it into a community and cultural center. But the borough has delayed. It has taken two years to move forward with the planning to preserve and renovate the building. During that time, no action has been taken to remove environmental hazards such as lead and asbestos and secure the building against future deterioration, and no grants have been applied for. We are in danger of losing this irreplaceable part of our town's history and life. This important part of our past could become an even more important part of our future, and with this addition to the 10 most endangered list, we hope that our town will rally behind us and save it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and thanks for your advocacy. Next, we have Diane Case from the Paulus Hook uh, Neighborhood Association. Come on up, Diane. Thank you, Emily. Things are flying. First of all, welcome, everyone. And I would like to say thank you to Preservation New Jersey and to the 10 Most Endangered Committee for acknowledging these buildings that are a vital part of our historic community in, in Paulus Hook as well as part of the larger national historic community. I would also like to thank the individuals who care so deeply about the history of Jersey City that they took the time to help craft this application for this valuable program that brings significant awareness to our fragile heritage. I am privileged to live in a neighborhood that was planted by the Jersey Associates, a group of New York real estate investors who saw opportunities in a couple of small islands surrounded by swamps across from Manhattan. One of the main investors is a name we all know, Alexander Hamilton. But there are many other names we in Jersey City use every day as they are remembered in street names, parks, and other community elements. 
Those of us gathered here today know well the challenges of historic buildings, whether we are owners, inhabitants, or preservation professionals. As a preservation architect, I've often found myself advocating for the buildings. It may sound a bit strange, but buildings have souls, they tell stories, and they have the ability to ground us in a way that nothing else can. St. Peter's school buildings experienced a civil war. They saw a new name start his political career that ended with Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson as President of the United States. They contained countless dream-filled children in classrooms on gorgeous days like this. I can only imagine the stories that these buildings could tell as they provided the physical framework for religious freedoms, for educational opportunities, as well as free speech to waves of immigrants to the United States. But now these historic structures are under threat by demolition, by purposeful neglect. To watch St. Peter's Prep, an organization based in Jesuit tradition, disregard these vital and serviceable artifacts of our collective history is painful and it's frankly unnecessary. Pope Francis in his encyclical notes that notes in his encyclical notes that we are to care and nurture as well to be aware of the loss of historic consequences. The, hope, the Pope encourages not just the young, but all of us not to spurn the spiritual human riches inherited from past generations and be ignorant of everything that came before, but to protect our common home in a myriad of ways. To that end, when St. Peter's Prep purchased these historic structures, they took on the responsibility of these structures. They are their caregivers. St. Peter's Prep has successfully adapted their historic campus buildings to provide what is considered one of the best educations offered in New Jersey. The Historic Paul's Hook Association has supported these efforts and we are happy to support their new modern field house located just outside the historic district. Demolition by neglect in an urban area that has some of the highest property values in the nation is suspect. And it makes us wonder if the land has come full circle. Is it again a piece of speculative real estate? We sincerely hope not, and we look forward to working with St. Peter's Prep to rehabilitate these structures, allowing them to continue to serve the community and the school many years into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Next is Dina Long speaking for the Sandlass House. Come on up. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Preservation New Jersey, for including the Sandless House of Sandy Hook in your recognitions today. Mm -hmm. um, my name's Dina Long. I formerly served as mayor of the borough of Seabright, the nor uh, neighboring municipality to Sandless House. And I'm here to represent Susan Gardner, formerly Sandless, and the local historians and advocates for saving the Sandless House. For us, the historical importance of the Sandless House is simple. It's the last remnant of the Highland Beach Resort. Probably you never heard of it. It existed on Sandy Hook before it became a national park. Highland Beach Resort welcomed hundreds of thousands of visitors to the Jersey Shore during the 1880s golden era. Highland Beach's founder, William Sandless, opened access to the beaches by providing facilities for a day at the beach to everyday people. Before that, our shoreline was mainly for the wealthy who could afford to stay in the hotels and spas. It was a social and cultural movement. And it's not just a local story for us in Monmouth County, it's a story of the Atlantic coastline, making it accessible to the everyday American. We carry this tradition forward every year when we buy a beach badge and head down the shore. Unfortunately, this keystone piece of our history has been wiped away by time and technology and politics. So thank you, Preservation New Jersey, for calling out the importance of the history of the Highland Beach Resort and supporting our efforts to save the Sandless House. Thank you so much, Dina. 
now we have a couple minutes left um, for other individuals representing sites that would like to say a few words today. Please just let me know if you'd like to come up and say say a few words. Okay, uh, come on up uh, from uh, Frank from Caldwell Library. Come on up. Frank Galuski from the Historic Preservation Commission in Caldwell. Okay. Thank you. Town Council has made a decision to uh, demolish the library, and um, it's practically one of those development, uh, redevelopment issues that are going on in New Jersey right now, and that's why Preservation New Jersey and this attention is so important. Um, the Council's decision to move forward in with in-person Zoom meetings gave an opportunity to approve this overscale, out-of-character municipal building complex while demolishing the Caldwell Library. And it's just like undemocratic. It's as undemocratic as an action and dictatorial, dictatorial political behavior as they can come. The first Presbyterian church, which owns the parcel of land for the proposed new municipal complex, had not even yet agreed to the land swap necessary for building the new building. Um, looking back to 2016, the, uh, we did extensive research into Caldwell Public Library's history through, through our Historic Preservation Commission, and uh, we granted the building uh, lo local landmark status. Our Chirka 1917 library is a Carnegie donated repository built to honor President Grover Cleveland. The architect was Lynn Grover Lockwood, the same architect as most valuable newly repurposed landmarks on our main street that can be seen in our downtown streets. Uh, since the library received landmark status in 2016, the Pine Brook, which runs parallel to Moonfield Avenue, caused flooding and severe damage to the library twice. The Historic Preservation Commission was not on the table through, throughout 2020-2021, while discussions to demolish this local landmark library advanced. Throughout the pandemic, a select group was informed by town leaders to plan a new municipal complex including a new library, weekly meetings, inviting municipal crew members, library staff, local enforcement, and local stakeholders uh, were invited to participate. So I could go on, but th uh, this is happening all over uh, New Jersey right now. Uh, it's redevelopment plans that are uh, nominating uh, they're designating parts of our uh, municipalities as area needs of redevelopment. And uh, therefore, all of the Historic Preservation Commission uh, laws are no longer in effect at that point because of uh, these ordinances. So um, thank you, Preservation New Jersey. And uh, this is a wonderful um, opportunity for um, you know, making the public more aware, because in town, in Cardwell, nobody was really aware of this. And and also, I'm, I'm grateful that um, uh, before it talked about this, including more, uh, you know, regulations in designating historic sites, because there's so many underdeveloped neighborhoods because of areas of redevelopment that are being, uh, and cemeteries that are being, um, you know, just sort of wiped away because of areas in need of redevelopment. So this is really what we need, and it should become legislation as soon as possible. And especially, all of the structures of the Underground Railroad, of the uh, remnants of physical structures that exist even today in towns like Montclair and even our town of Caldwell, these stories are undocumented because there's not the criteria needed to document these. So we need action on this. Thank you.
wind is kind of getting to the better of us, and we want to make sure we um, get to the Trent house shortly. So I heard two people that said they can be quick and, and <laughs> short. Okay, okay, great. So we are. We'll do. We'll do two, two more here, um, and then uh, three. Quick. All right, three quick. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. I don't want to stop anybody. It's just starting to be very windy and a little bit, uh, a little challenging out here. Okay. So please um, welcome up. Uh, we have somebody here from. Um, Cedar Grove uh, Cemetery to speak. Come on up. Hopefully everybody can hear me. It's uh, great. Um, I actually come from Toronto. I moved up there 45 years ago from New Jersey. I teach at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Um, two years ago, and my story unfortunately has been repeated too many times in the history of New Jersey. I grew up here. I started doing historical research two years ago on my family's farming uh, in northern New Jersey in 1711, uh, only to found, find out that my family were major slaveholders in the state of New Jersey. We never knew that slaves existed when I grew up. It was never taught in school. I uh, knew nothing about the history. Then I find out that our family with uh, uh, Dutch farmers partnered with enslaved Africans, cleared 2,800 acres of what is now suburban Cedar Grove by, two, by a single hand saw and using a chain wrapped around the trunk of a tree to clear the land. Backbreaking work, every single house in Cedar Grove is sitting on land cleared by Dutch farmers and enslaved Africans. The final insult comes to rest when they are buried in our family cemetery the Doremus Family Burial Grove ground in Cedar Grove, and I contact the city to say I would like to erect a monument to the enslaved Africans who were buried in this cemetery, and find out when I come down here that not only are, is the news of having been um, cleared by enslaved Africans or having enslaved Africans in the cemetery is unwelcome news, and our research team has forbidden the second ground on the National uh, Historic Site, but I also find out that uh, PSE&G has built a power line over the cemetery and accidentally has uh, eroded the size of the cemetery and the headstones and the graves are sliding down the hill. So as we speak, the cemetery is disintegrating. We will only have a great future if we honor and learn about the past. Covering up the history of a town, covering up the fact that in 1800 the population of Cedar Grove was 20 to 25 percent black and turned by 1900 to entirely white is not the way to tell the history of our country. Also, not recognizing in the burial grounds those people whose labor made this country are, are kept for a permanent rest. We need to be able to recognize our past. Cemeteries are a place that we recognize our past. We have to be allowed to tell the truth about our history. Thank you very much. Sorry. Oh, yes. If you want the entire story of Cedar Grove, we have uh, things here. You can just click on it and get the full 28-page history of the, the cemetery and, and its uh, work. Thank you, Tori. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dory. I've been fortunate to visit the cemetery with Dory and learn about uh, learn about the threats. Next, we're going to have um, David Prianto from the USS Ling uh, come speak. Come on up, David. I do uh, 
uh, envision a future where the Ling uh, remains in, where it is in Hackensack, New Jersey, uh, integrated into uh, the river permanently into a uh, permanent enclosure there, and uh, our uh, community can take part in witnessing the preservation and working together to, to preserve this, this history uh, and make that part of the, the uh, its future. Uh, but once again, just to uh, keep it brief, so thank you very much, and thank you for Preservation New Jersey. Thank you, David, and thank you to everyone uh, from the USS Link for the volunteers for their advocacy. Last but certainly not least, Dolly Marshall, who is speaking again on the uh, behalf of the cemetery theme for Johnson Cemetery in Camden. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dolly Marshall. I am a historical preservation activist. I nominated and submitted the application for Johnson Cemetery. And what brought me here is 15 years of family genealogical history. Um, actually, my great-grandfather, William H. Jones, was a prominent politician and was appointed here at this very building in 1896. And through my research about him, I discovered where he was buried, and where he is buried is Johnson Cemetery in Camden, along with about six other ancestors, going back to my maternal great 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 grandparents. So I'll be very brief. If you aren't if you aren't aware about the uh, state of Johnson Cemetery, it was created in 1854 by three African American men. Um, it was a place for African Americans to be buried with dignity because the cemeteries at that time in Camden City and all cities prevented black people from being buried in white cemeteries. So um, to this day, I have evolved into a preservationist. I think New Jersey preservation um, for shedding awareness on the plight of cemeteries. Um, Johnson's in particular um, is linked to another cemetery that I also represent is called Mount Peace Cemetery in Lawnside, New Jersey. So without Johnson Cemetery, Mount Peace would have never existed because Johnson Cemetery became filled to capacity by 1900 and there wasn't any other place for African Americans to be buried. So you're looking at the face of cemetery preservation. I am the face of cemetery preservation um, because I think it's very, um, people can become very detached from it when you hear certain types of things, but I am the face. Um, I continuously research and I am here to speak for my ancestors, to speak for all ancestors, um, because the current state of Johnson's, there are no headstones. The headstones were moved in the late 70s, early 80s, and dumped into the Delaware River. So the headstones that remain um, are placed away from the cemetery grounds, off to the side, um, and there's about a handful of them. Johnson Cemetery is more than a park, because it's called a memorial park. It is the final resting place of brave African-American veterans. There's over 107 military veterans, including Civil War, um, Spanish-American War, and also World War I. But it was also a place created for everyday black citizens. So I want you to be mindful of Johnson Cemetery and to know that I am a descendant and there's many of us that are interested in preservation and I hope you will become more interested in the vast history that cemeteries hold. Thank you. Thank you, Dolly, and thank you for that, that powerful reminder, the importance of cemeteries. Now, I, I'm happy uh, to let you all know that there's time for more networking, more connecting with the preservation community. We are moving our, the, our event to the William Trent House, which was an award winner at the Preservation Awards. I also want to let you know about several upcoming events at Preservation New Jersey, ways for you to stay involved, stay engaged with the preservation community. We have um, coming up on July 30th, a tour of Flemington, New Jersey with marketing committee member Ricky Masson and number of people that he's assembled there for that event. On September 8th, we have an event at Shady Rest in Scott Plains with Ruby Simmons, Where's Ruby? Uh, Ruby, Ruby and the Wonder and Barton and volunteers that have worked to bring that 
former 10 most endangered historic place back to life. And that's what we love to see and that's what we want to show people. Another event coming up um, just this week, May 21st, is at the 1867 Sanctuary, which is a project, an adaptive reuse project um, organized by Preservation New Jersey. There's a concert by Clifford Erickson and Kathy can wave. Kathy's the volunteer manager at the 1867 Sanctuary, another 10 most endangered historic place, now back in use as a cultural center. So these are the kind of stories that we want to be able to tell more of. We can only do that through the education and advocacy of the 10 most endangered historic places list and the work that our organization does every single day of the year and the work that everyone here does every single day of the year. I know that nomination process was challenging. Coming here is, it can be challenging. Everything that you do for your site is such a labor of love and we appreciate it at Preservation New Jersey. I truly hope that you stay and enjoy and network with us. We have a lot of sandwiches, a lot of cookies, a lot of cold drinks over at the William Trent House. There'll also be tours of the William Trent House. They actually won a, an award because of the interesting way they've interpreted the history of William Trent here in the city, but also um, the enslaved Americans that were on his site um, working in the land of Trenton and at the William Trent House. So you can go and learn more about that at the site, as well as enjoy networking and a lunch. So we'll all be heading there now. I hope to see you there so we can talk more. Again, this wonderful first in-person event for us in many months. And again, just thank you so much for coming and for supporting these sites across the state of New Jersey. Thank you.